Okay, so the time is two o'clock, so I'm going to start. Hi, everyone. Thanks, and uh, welcome to today's workshop on implementing the TCFD recommendations. Um, today is being hosted by the UN Global Compact Network UK and the Prince's Accounting for Sustainability Project. Um, so it's great that you're all able to join us, and I uh, can see a few familiar names here. Hope you're all safe and well, um, that you're doing okay in these times, um, and that you're all ready for another online session. So before we get started, um, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate and make sure we have a productive session. Um, so though it's taking place virtually, I would like to emphasize that this is designed as a workshop rather than a webinar. So we've tried to keep the number of attendees down and we would like to keep you uh, thoroughly engaged throughout and for you to participate as necessary. Um, if you'd like to put your camera on, you're, you're very welcome to, but please keep your microphone on mute so we limit the amount of background noise. Uh, we will have a couple of interactive elements um, today, so we really encourage you to participate in those. Um, so there will be a poll with some questions um, that I'll ask you to answer. Um, and also later on, um, we'll be doing a group exercise which will involve the annotation function. So we'll explain that when we reach that point. Um, so if you would like to submit a question to the speakers, please do so using the chat box feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can submit these any anytime throughout the presentation. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to answer these at the end. If not, um, we'll follow up with you in an email afterwards. Um, and also just to let you know that this uh, session is being recorded, so it will be available for you afterwards. Okay, so I think there's still a few people um, joining, but we've got a lot to fit in, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so, if you don't know me already, uh, my name is Amy Collins and I lead our climate program at the UN Global Compact Network UK. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by our guest speaker, Jonathan Dunn, who is the head of international policy and planning at Anglo American. Uh, we also have Steve Kenzie, the executive director, who's the senior manager for sustainability and accounting at A4S. So on today's agenda, um, I'll be handing over to Elizabeth shortly as she'll be providing some insight into uh, the current climate landscape, um, as well as introducing the TCFD framework, um, the recent findings, and the benefits of adopting the TCFD. Uh, we will then move on to a dialogue on TCFD implementation between Jonathan and Steve, uh, where Jonathan will share his experience and insights into how and why Anglo-American adopted the TCFD as well as um, sharing challenges that they faced in doing so. So very much looking forward uh, to hearing from him. And if you do have any questions for Jonathan, please do um, send these in the chat box and we'll have time during, during that dialogue to answer them hopefully. And then later on, we'll be doing a group exercise where we'll invite you to start thinking about climate risks and opportunities that could have a financial impact on your organization. We'll then hear briefly about um, further guidance that's on offer to help you in your TCFD journey. Um, and we should hopefully have some time at the end uh, to answer any questions that you might have. So this workshop is designed for both finance and sustainability professionals, um, as these are the divisions who would most likely be engaged um, in your company's work. And we hope that by attending this workshop, you will gain a better understanding of the TCFD framework um, and how to implement the recommendations as well as why you should be doing so. So I'd just like to hand over to Elizabeth now, who's uh, going to introduce the TCFD for us. 
Thank you, Amy, and hello, everyone, and welcome again to this webinar. So I will first spend a few minutes to talk about the global climate landscape um, from a risk and a regulatory perspective. So you can see on the next slide that um, this is the global risk landscape map um, from the World Economic Forum's Global Annual Risk Report, uh, which was published in January this year. So it maps out the global risks by likelihood and impact over the next 10 years. So you can see on the chart that um, climate action failure and extreme weather are at the top of the chart, the right hand corner. Um, and they've been up there for many years. Um, climate change is striking harder and more rapidly than many expected. Uh, we had several extreme weather events last year across the world, um, and climate-related issues are really dominating all of the top five uh, long-term risk in terms of likelihood. Um, if we then look at the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, on the next slide, um, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. So the 17 goals are very much interconnected and for companies, this global framework can help um, turn business risks into opportunities and inspire innovation in the products and services that, that they, they provide in a way that contributes to the goals. And you can see goal 13 is about climate action. Um, just a few days ago, um, the UN Secretary General uh, released the 2020 SDG progress report. Um, it says the year 2019 was the second warmest on record and the end of the warmest decade that we've had. Uh, with a global average temperature of 1.1 uh, degree above estimated pre-industrial levels, um, the global community is really way off track to meeting either the 1.5 or 2 degree targets called for um, in the Paris Agreement. Um, and although um, greenhouse gas emissions are projected to drop um, about 6% this year um, because of the COVID-19, um, this improvement is only temporary. Um, so the UN is really calling for governments and businesses to accelerate the transitions required to achieve the Paris Agreement. Um, they need to make systemic shifts and transformational changes um, to low GHG emission and also climate resilient uh, economies and societies. Um, so if we look at the regulatory um, perspective um, on the next slide, um, so um, globally, if we look at director's duties, um, the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative uh, published a paper last year which looked, which looked at um, director's liability and climate risk. Um, so comparing uh, Australia, Canada, South Africa and the UK. So the paper examined the legal basis for directors to take account of climate risks and responses to climate change under the prevailing statutory and common laws. So what was found is that the, uh, under the laws in those countries, um, the director's duties regimes can be applied to governance failures in terms of the identification, uh, assessment, uh, oversight, and also disclosure of climate-related financial risks. So going forward, um, for board directors, uh, they should really approach um, their governance of climate change in the same way as they would um, any other financial matter. And in terms of rules for reporting, um, in October last year, uh, Mr. Mark Carney spoke at the TCFD summit, um, warning like major companies that they really only have two years to agree on the rules for reporting on climate risks before the regulators step in and devise their own and even make the uh, disclosure mandatory. Um, and we see progress has been made by large banks and energy companies to try to harmonize how they report their risk and um, but the progress um, in both quantitative and qualitative disclosure is sort of uneven across different sectors. And increasingly, investors are looking at um, whether companies really understand uh, climate risk and how that impact the strategy, how resilient the strategy is, um, and also how climate risk impact um, credit ratings. Um, in Europe, the EU published uh, non-binding guidelines last year, um, integrating the TCFD recommendations into the non-financial reporting directive, the NFRD. And that applies to large listed companies, banks and insurers. Um, they actually just completed a public consultation a few days ago um, on revisions to the NFRD, 
which focus on a number of areas, including um, the quality and scope of non-financial information to be disclosed, um, standardization of disclosure, materiality, uh, assurance, uh, structure and location of the disclosures, which are all applicable when thinking about implementing the TCFD recommendations. And in the UK, uh, we were one of the first countries to uh, formally endorse the TCFD recommendations. Um, and the UK government's green finance strategy, which was released last July, uh, uh, built on this. Um, it sets out the expectation that all listed companies and large asset owners should disclose in line with TCFD by 2022. Um, so the government will conduct an interim review of progress this year and a formal review in 2022. Um, there's also a task force um, with UK regulators chaired by the government to examine what is the most effective way to approach disclosure, including mandatory reporting. So really we need to think about um, reporting climate risks as ultimately becoming mandatory. Um, and we need to have more quality data and also create a level playing field across sectors as well, which is really important. So that's a quick overview of the risk and regulatory landscape. Now I will talk about the TCFD framework and some latest trends and findings. So the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures was established to develop recommendations for more effective climate related disclosures to achieve two main aims really uh, first to promote more informed investment credit and insurance underwriting decisions which would then in turn enable stakeholders to understand better the concentrations of carbon related assets in the financial sector and the financial systems exposures to climate related risks so the recommendations were published in 2017 and are structured around four thematic areas as you can see on the the screen now yes so they are governance strategy risk management and metrics and targets which actually represent the core elements of how organizations operate and on the next slide you can see that under each of those uh, thematic areas there are specific disclosures 11 in total um, I won't go through each one now but you can take a look in your own time um, there are also some key elements to note um, Organizations should provide these disclosures because they are financial disclosures um, in their uh, financial filings and that will be very useful for decision makers, um, whether it's investors or others. Um, they should also look at materiality, so um, report only on the climate related issues that are material to your organization and you should approach this the way that you do for other information included in your financial filing, filings. And also there should be disclosure of forward-looking information um, through scenario analysis and specifically the task force uh, recommend that organizations should describe the resilience of their strategy against different um, climate scenarios including a two degree or lower scenario. Um, and the task force has also developed guidance uh, for all sectors and also supplementary guidance for certain sectors to help organizations uh, Im implement the recommendations, as you can see on the next slide. So all these are available um, on the TCFD Knowledge Hub. Um, if you are uh, from one of those specific sectors uh, that you can see on the next slide, then know that there are supplementary guidance on the website which you can refer to. So next I just want to share some findings uh, from a TCFD survey done quite recently. Um, it shows that um, progress is being made to improve the availability and quality of disclosures, but more companies need to disclose material findings. So going back to that materiality principle. Um, three out of five companies view climate risk as material and do use scenario analysis, but they do not disclose information on the resilience of their strategies, or at least not yet. Um, and investors say that they, they still need more clarity on the potential financial impact of, of climate change on companies. And also, um, I saw in the poll just now that we have people from the sustainability and finance function uh, present here today. And the survey found that while the sustainability function is the primary driver of TCFD implementation, um, finance, risk management, and also executive management are increasingly getting involved as well. Um, and on the next chart, you can see that um, 
The number of recommended disclosures on the, on the left you can see is increasing, but not fast enough. And in terms of the challenges that companies face in implementing TCFD, um, disclosing assumptions is difficult as they include um, confidential business information sometimes. And the lack of standardized metrics within an, in a given industry, which is also an area that is important um, to investors as they look to compare the performance of companies in the same in industry. So on the next slide, uh, there are some stats on commitments that uh, preparers and um, preparers have, uh, have made. 91% um, said they have decided to fully or partially implement the recommendations and 67% plan to complete implementation within three years. So if TCFD does become mandatory in the coming so two to three years, um, more companies need to get ready. Um, from the user's perspective, 85% cited an increase in the availability of climate-related financial disclosures and 76% um, say they use these disclosures in their decision making. So that's, that's a fairly high um, percentage. So after looking at these um, trends and findings, I just want to summarize um, for you the, the benefits of implementing TCFD for companies. So um, they will help you to make better decisions um, because you will have better awareness and understanding of climate risk opportunities and the, the implications for your company. Um, you will start looking at climate risk in your strategic planning and risk management. And you also start to have governance arrangements in place to address these. So this will all lead to better decision making. Um, and with improved disclosures, uh, you can meet disclosure requirements and investor demands. Um, there will be a reduced risk of any legal liability by failing to um, assess, manage and disclose climate risk um, in accordance with director's duties. Um, and you might even be involved in shaping disclosure requirements prior to regulatory action. Um, last but not least, there will be improved uh, evaluation of risk and exposures by lenders, insurers and underwriters so your company can maintain access to capital or even potential lower cost of capital. Um, and there will also be reduced risk of in investor action as well. So um, on the next slide, um, and also from the poll results I saw just now, I think many of you are maybe just starting to implement TCD or thinking about how to get started. Um, so um, I just want to encourage you that um, you know few organizations have all the information needed to implement the recommendations in full in their first year of reporting. Um, so start with areas that you can address easily um, and then develop long, longer term plans to tackle the more challenging areas. And incomplete disclosure is better than no disclosure. Um, scenario analysis is really useful, but it might take time to implement fully. Um, so you can see uh, there's a, a link at the bottom of the screen. Um, so there are a number of resources available on the A4S website, which you might find useful, um, such as the top tips for implementing TCFD. And there are also some practical examples on scenario analysis as well. Um, I just have a few summary slides here on um, how Unilever, Tesco and SSE have tackled uh, scenario analysis under the TCFD framework. Um, I'll just go through them quickly. Um, for Unilever, they piloted an analysis on soy, which is one of the main ingredients in the, in the supply chain. Um, Tesco also focused on the supply chain and there was close collaboration between the finance team and the environment team in driving the scenario analysis. Um, for SSE, they stress tested their business against three core climate scenarios um, and use it as a basis for ongoing stakeholder engagement. So you can, you can read the full details um, on our website um, by following the links that are provided here. Um, so that's a quick uh, update um, on the um, sort of risk and regulatory landscape and also an, a quick introduction to the TCFD framework and trends. So I will now pass the time back to Steve, I believe. That's right. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. That was really interesting. Um, and uh, welcome again, Jonathan. Um, delighted that you're able to join us and share your actual experience uh, of a major uh, global company uh, coming to terms with uh, TCFD. Uh, no, Steve, thanks for the invitation. And may I apologize, apologize if my son comes in and delivers any more homeschooling um, during <laughs> the conversation. I'm sure it's something we're all going through at the moment. Yes, oh, that's that would be great. Um, 
Okay, so just to start off, maybe a, a general question, and, and how could you share with us Anglo-Americans' approach to adopting the TCFD? Take us on the journey th th that your company went on. Of course, and just very quickly, for those who don't know Anglo-American, we're a global mining group. Um, we're spread operating in 10 countries. We are diversified, meaning that we produce um, many commodities, copper, iron ore, platinum group metals, uh, diamonds through the De Beers group and uh, and coal um, and as a consequence we've produced coal for about 100 years so um, the whole question of climate and investor pressure on us has been uh, significant in the past um, and just to kind of roll back if I may uh, you know the, the whole focus on on climate change for us as a company has been um, it's been decades long it's not not a new thing and we started to disclose various different aspects of about energy usage and our on our emissions um, years ago and that kind of got solidified a little bit by the CDP um, process which was really helpful in terms of digging into what what was clear that that process wanted us to disclose but it tended to be backward looking it tended to be specific numbers and for those of you who know the the CDP process you then get a ranking so if you get a certain score you're in an A bracket if you get a different score you're in a lower bracket and it felt to us, it didn't quite fit with the way we were starting to think about um, energy and carbon and how we wanted a more holistic approach to managing it and a more, if you like, narrative approach to managing it. And as we were thinking about that, the TCFD came along and it was almost like it was perfect match for the way we'd started to, to, to think about the issues because it's, it's built, as we all know, as, as Elizabeth just shared, for the, for the financial community. So it's about describing if you like a process by which you are assessing the risk managing the risk and looking at your strategy against uh, all the various different um, um, indicators and it, it kind of merged for us the not only the what we were reporting but why we were reporting it um, which was um, extremely uh, important and it allows sort of flexibility other forms of disclosure ask specific questions and you have to uh, sometimes adapt your data in order to answer their questions rather than being able to present your story what it is that you're actually doing and and in the context of um uh, of the data sheet um that you, you you assess for tcfd it gives you a little bit of well, transparency because you're producing your data direct to your investors and they can look at it and they can make their own judgments but also a bit of um a flexibility so in one sense, it was kind of serendipitous. It fitted with the way we were looking at doing things and it worked very well. And, and you shared the slide, which is this is taken directly from our integrated annual report because Elizabeth was saying how it should be factored into our financial findings. Now, I wanted to share this very briefly. You don't have to read all the detail. This is simply the, the structure, as Elizabeth showed, of TCFD and then where you might find the detail for that. And I, I highlight it for two reasons. One, that um, there's a there's a mainstreaming aspect to this it's not all in one place because there are different issues and that's perfectly okay and if you're talking about the governance structures around how you manage any risk it doesn't necessarily have to be pulled out into a climate section but also there's different bits of data in different places which help tell the full story and then finally of course any any big company will have a uh, a top risk register which you'll publish and, and, and how that comes together how it doesn't have to be specific to TCFD but of course there is um, there is overlap um, I think you asked Steve um, what what we did to start and, and actually what we did to start was we did a gap analysis we used this very basic structure and we said okay we know we're already doing a lot of this stuff um, are we and where is it what does it look like and that very quickly enabled us to work out how much we were already doing and how much of the story we could already tell and where were the where were the big gaps i think you're on mute steve i, I think it's really interesting because one and I, I think i've seen this and it's so true of many times when initiatives like this are launched as something that's being done to business um, so it's really great to hear that actually the business case that Elizabeth described is, is really valid and that you got actual benefit from the process and that it was aligned with actual very natural approach to dealing with this issue that your company was already, already using. Indeed. And one other thing I'd say, which is, which is really important, and it goes to Elizabeth's point about partial disclosure, if you like, or, or 
but some of it is better than all of it. Some of it is better than none of it, rather. Is that, um, as I said before, with some other ratings, it's a pass fail. Whereas this, you know, we, we're disclosing against this, but we don't think for a moment that we've finished our journey with TCFD. Um, we can be better, we can do more. And, and that's about making your disclosure ever more granular and less anecdotal, moving more and more from, from qualitative to quantitative, which is actually really difficult. And we'll come on to scenario analysis, I'm sure in a moment. Um, but but there's, a, there's a kind of evolution that you can go along, which you can go along the journey with your investors because, but, but at the same time you're saying stru the, the structure remains the same, but within different parts of that structure, we improve, we increase our transparency, we increase our granularity, and we therefore enable our investors to really understand that we understand the risks, we're managing the risks, and we're resilient for the long term. Along that evolution, were there any particular challenges that that you had to overcome? For example, getting buy-in internally uh, as you had to move across teams to to meet the recommendations. Um, the, the genuinely weren't. Uh, the, I can absolutely understand that question, and I can understand that in certain circumstances that would be a problem. But because it kind of fitted with the way we're thinking as a business, there weren't those kind of challenges. If anything, the challenges that we had were because we were um, starting to uh, to evolve our thinking along TCFD whilst the TCFD itself was still evolving its guidance and what have you. There was a bit of a, if you like, shadow boxing or dancing around exactly what certain things might have meant. And so it took us a little bit of time to fully understand. The, the mindset shift perhaps is a little different in that you're moving from reporting what's happened to thinking about what might happen and what the risks are. And, and, and in a disclosure space, that's quite, that's not particularly comfortable um, because you have to be quite confident in what you're saying because you don't want to put stuff out to investors, which is, which is poorly thought through. And so that, that mindset shift and how comfortable we are or aren't with projecting forward is, is probably the biggest challenge we still face, frankly. Um, but the internal buy-in was not, was not difficult. You mentioned scenario analysis, and, and I think generally recognize that's probably the most intimidating aspect of the recommendations. Um, could you explain to us how, how Anglo-American has coped with that? Yeah, so, so we've got, we've done two separate forms of scenario analysis, which I hope is, is not necessary for most businesses. And the reason we've done is that the physical risk side of climate analysis is, is very important, the scenario analysis. So um, we operate in places where uh, there's severe water stress, for example, or an ex excess, excess of water in countries around the world. And um, as a consequence, we wanted to be really clear as to what um, that our operations were resilience to climate change and interestingly and we'll come to sort of um forward-looking scenarios which this slide is from um which is more demand-led the the we're thinking then of the really upper end of of where climate change might go you know what does it look like in the um, areas of chile if you have a four or five degree increase in temperature is that is that viable and we built models together with the uk met office that we applied to our operations and we we're able to see um, what that might mean um, for those operations and how we then build into the planning for those operations that they uh, can uh, can survive and what mitigations we can put in place. That's one part, but the, the part that most people think of when we're talking about scenario analysis is is, is what, what this resulted in, which is actually a, li a little bit like I think the Tesco's and the Unilever's and the, um, uh, and the SSE were talking about, which is what does it mean for our our actual business and our business is selling minerals. Um, so what does it mean for the end, um, uh, the end sectors and the markets for the metals and the minerals that we're producing? And so what we did was we took um, the, the IEA's um, uh, scenario, the sustainable development scenario, which is a two degree scenario. And their, um, I think they call it the new policy scenario. It might've changed, the language may have changed in the most recent um, documents. And we use them as our baselines, but then what we did was using their information, we disaggregated them. And we understood by major end sector, so in our case, that's things like uh, industry, it's uh, transport, it's, um, what else have I missed? I can't think of another one, another one that I will have missed. And we tried to understand with the, uh, the 
information we could see as to how the emissions would go, what actually would happen with those end sectors, and then feed that back into the profit pools or the demand that we'd expect for the industry, and then what that would mean um, for us. That's a really complex piece of work. It's an extremely complex piece of work, very valuable piece of work because it gets you really thinking about assumptions that have to be made in order to go from where we are on the trajectory down to down to two degrees in the first instance and perhaps lower. Um, and it then helps you disentangle what that might mean for for first of all the the overall commodities and secondly our specific um, assets. And why do I make that distinction? Well, because clearly some assets in mining are are different points of the um, of the the profit of the uh, the cost curve, and as a consequence, if 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 things get particularly tricky in that sector, it may or may not be asset that's still still viable. The additional challenge with with this, and this is why I highlight this graph, and it's it, the reason I put it up is because how vague it is, and I shouldn't say that about our own our own work, but it it highlights for me in a nutshell the challenge we have. So. What it shows is the overall outlook for commodity profit pools out to 2050, according to the two scenarios that we use, which were the new policies and the two degrees. And, and it's, it's got no scale, it's got no, um, no real specificities beyond just saying that some will be more positive than others. Behind that, it's a whole load of data that we worked on, but what you really struggle with, what we struggled with, is you're then saying, well, what are we willing to put out in what is essentially financial disclosure? What can we honestly say out to 2050 that we feel confident enough to say is auditable data to be able to tell a story about how resilient we are? And you end up in this battle between something that's very vague through to something which is really specific, but frankly, you can't honestly say with any, uh, any, uh, any strength of conviction is exactly what's going to happen. Roll it, and if you think about 2050, 2050 is 30 years away. For us as a mining company, most of our assets will have will have closed by then. The current assets we have, so we're then trying to measure the apple today with the pear of 2050, and and say that there's some kind of um, of consistency. It's a really it's a really difficult thing in that regard for a company like us, but the simple. Um, uh, the simple fact of imagining the world of the future and working back through that world to what that might mean for for markets is just a, an extremely powerful uh, piece of work to do so i'm sorry if that wasn't uh, very specific to our business but hopefully of some some use no that's really interesting so i um i have two more questions one a follow-on from this uh scenario planning because i i i think um you demonstrate a uh, significant degree of optimism uh, and faith in our uh, global governance um, that these are the two scenarios that you looked at. Um, so curious as to why you didn't look at a more uh, pessimistic uh, view um, where we don't uh, manage to stay uh, below two degrees. And then uh, as just to wrap up, because we we are pushing our our time limit just um your top tips uh for yep. for uh, our audience uh that are in the same boat or, or a little behind you thank you so so you have to pick scenarios right you have to pick a some scenarios to judge and it's a big piece of work to disentangle them so we we did start with um current trajectory as it were the i can't remember what the iea call it but the um the one that's based on what's happening right now business as usual perhaps our judgment was even then that that policies were being into, implemented which were shifting that trajectory so we didn't see it as a particularly sensible thing to spend a lot of time and money uh, exploring we also looked um, at the other side of the scenario very briefly at 1.5 and, and whilst we were doing this work because this work actually issued just over a year ago whilst we were doing this work the ipcc came out with their difference between 1.5 and 2 um, work and we we talked about whether at that stage we were able to to create a 1.5 scenario, very difficult to create it from start, from a starting point. And so that's why we use the IEA's work as a basis. And, and one of the things about comparability between companies is what's the basis on which you build your scenario. So we try to be consistent doing that. The IEA didn't have a 1.5 degree scenario. So that's the short answer. The top tips I'd say, 
more widely on TCFD, not on scenario analysis necessarily. Necessarily, start with the gap analysis. It's very, very straightforward to start that, and probably for most businesses, you'll very quickly realise that actually quite a lot of the stuff's already there. Quite a lot of the building blocks. Any well-run company anywhere will be doing a lot of these things already. Um, it's about putting it in the package that the TC or using the framework of the TCS, TCFD to to understand and, and see it. That's fantastic. Jonathan, thanks very much for your insights uh, and your, your generous um, uh, sharing of all of this. And now back to Elizabeth, I believe. So uh, many of you are just starting on this journey. Um, so I would like to just uh, go through what some of the um, risk and opportunities that might be relevant to your organization and you can see how um, on here um, you think about how they uh, impact your strategic planning risk management and then having financial impact um, on your organization so um, take a look at the um, different examples on the screen um, if we look down risks um, under policy and legal um, you know, we, we, we talked about how mandatory reporting is very likely. So what would that mean to your organization? Um, in terms of technology, um, you know, your existing products and services uh, might be substituted with lower emissions options. So what would that mean to your organization? Um, increased cost of raw materials, um, shift in consumer preferences. These will all have financial implications for your organizations. And in terms of physical risk, um, you know, your physical assets, buildings that you own, you know, um, if we have more um, extreme weather events, what does that mean uh, for your organization? Um, opportunities, so uh, resource efficiency, um, energy source, so looking at opportunities for you to move to more um, efficient buildings or more efficient ways of um, operating. Um, you might want to uh, invest in R&D and innovation um, so that you can develop new products or services with a lower uh, climate impact. Um, and access to new markets, and we talked about um, you know, access to, um, to capital. Um, investors are looking at companies that really um, understand um, climate risk and, um, and know how to address them. Um, so take a look at these uh, examples and then um, maybe we start with part one of the exercise. Um, invite um, a few participants to just share about um, what some of the climate related risks that they are looking at uh, in their organization or they think might impact, might have a financial impact on their organization. Um, <laughs> um, may I invite Justin to share, if you wouldn't mind? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think the, the risks for our business, I mean, I work for international windscreen repair and replacement company and the main risk I think here is around increased costs of operating so carbon pricing and probably reporting although we're currently a private company um, so the, the risk is probably about any future planned transition towards becoming a public organization and what that might mean in terms of the different legislations which are going to impact on us from a, from a climate point of view. Um, the other thing potentially is around reputation. Generally customers are moving, they're interested more in how we impact on climate and currently we don't report very clearly how having your windscreen replaced or repaired impacts on uh, a customer's carbon footprint. Uh, and again, I think the market generally um, is sort of moving in that way. So, so there's a reputation and sort of market link there. Mm. Uh, I think generally the, the biggest risk is probably around new legislation coming in, which increases costs and reporting requirements, which we're not currently ready to fulfill. Yeah, and I think many companies would agree with you there. Um, and are you finding it um, 
easy to sort of think about the risk and then translating that into sort of the financial implication for your organization? Uh, in terms of carbon pricing and reporting, that's relatively straightforward. I guess the other aspects um, are a little bit less easy. Uh, probably the other risk I sort of made a note of was that repair is a very low climate impact compared to replacement. But the value of repair is also a lot lower than replacement where the margins are higher. So if we were to shift to a more repair related business quite aggressively, um, so really pushing customers to repair rather than replace, that would have a better impact on the climate, less windscreens need to be manufactured, that's a huge impact um, on our product carbon footprint. But obviously that also means there's a risk there in terms of how do we reorganize and re, um, remodel our business because yeah. really the turnover would be a lot lower, and therefore our business model has to be different in order to cope with it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, may I invite um, Mark, Mark Lancelot to share? He's still there. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi, yeah. yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, so, so I work for a consultancy, so uh, you know, our, our kind of internal perspective around carbon is right? you know, much more about the offices we used and travel has kind of direct impacts and uh, both things we're kind of looking at how to address. So more, more of our sort of focus in this area is around talking to kind of clients and the consulting work we're doing in this space and that kind of varies by topics so uh, we've been talking to a number of the banks at the moment around this um, you know particularly around how they respond in the UK to the kind of PRA and some of them are looking to implement sort of TCFD uh, as part of their response uh, you know the things they're wrestling with is some of the you know, the kind of quantification methodology. So how do you actually translate uh, and go through the process of looking at scenarios and looking across the different books and translate that into financial exposure. Uh, some real challenges are around sort of data. So what kind of the, the data sources they use to, to look at some of the Kind of risk drivers and how they're going to play out across their portfolios and that's going to differ by, by kind of sector so there's a whole piece they're looking at at the moment which will kind of evolve over time as well as kind of new data sources kind of come online uh, so those, those are kind of two of the, the kind of big areas that, that we kind of sort of see challenges in at the moment from talking to talking to people yeah well thank you that's really interesting um and maybe we can move on to um, looking at climate related opportunities. Um, Andrew, can I pick on you? Because <laughs> a lot of people are not showing the video, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, so I work for a, uh, a global textile company. Uh, based in the UK, but manufacturing uh, pretty much everywhere except for the UK. Um, and um, we are sort of deep in the uh, textile supply chain. So we're an industrial to industrial company um, and we're providing components going into uh, the supply chain, uh, which is a very long and complex supply chain. And as, as, as most people are aware, you know, it's come under a lot of scrutiny in the recent past justifiably for its um, environmental footprint and, and, and climate impacts are you know, a big part of that. Um, so we, we are sort of in the midst of this process, I guess, we're, we're sort of doing a deep dive on scenarios at the moment, uh, trying to look forward uh, the impact on our operations and on, on our business model uh, of various different scenarios, uh, you know, we've got 
uh, we've got manufacturing sites in, in, in Bangladesh, for example, which are likely to be underwater under certain scenarios and so on and so forth. So uh, we're, we're, we're sort of getting into quite a lot of uh, detail on this at the moment. Um, and our focus has been more at the moment on the, on the risk side of it rather than the opportunities side. Clearly, areas of our business do open opportunities here. Uh, we're, we're shifting to renewables. We, we've got uh, a whole part of our business which is focused on uh, light weighting. Um, so, um, uh, you know, carbon, uh, carbon, composites are textile materials and we produce them and 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 so you know we service the automotive and other industries with with the um, products which will help out through uh, this process uh, we haven't we haven't sort of got into yet identifying sort of completely new potential market areas or anything like this that might emerge uh, it's it's um, I get I guess at the moment, you know, our, our focus is, is, is mainly risk-based, but with, with a few of the more obvious opportunities uh, sort of uh, presenting themselves on the table. But it's um, um, uh, quite, quite honestly, at the, at, at the moment, um, the, the textile industry, it's, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, COVID has sort of completely sort of twisted our, our sort of focus a little bit because uh, uh, because the resilience of the industry to that has um, uh, has been dreadful yeah <laughs> so, um, you know the, the 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 whole industry is has basically stopped uh, mm. with with massive global impacts at the moment and uh, and yes. um, and so and so that that I guess you know, in 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 some senses, is actually a helpful helpful thing to be happening at the moment because because it really is uh, causing us to sort of rethink some of the some of the very basic assumptions that we are sort of thinking about in terms of our scenarios as to you know uh, is it, is this still going to be the case in the future because actually you know within within a matter of months we will probably see a very different global textile industry to that which we have had for the last 20 years yeah. uh, so so that degree of rapid change and 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 dramatic shifts in the business models and the opportunities that are opening up i mean you know we're 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 heavily into pp uh, ppe now uh, <laughs> at, at the medical level which yes. you know we've always been into ppe at the at the firefighter level but we've sort of gone into a whole new industry through that so um i don't know if that's helpful or not it's very much worth i know it. yeah it's really interesting and thank you for sharing and i guess even before covid i mean even you know for your industry or your, for your company just understanding um your supply chain and the, the complexity and and you know where along the supply chain you 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 have that influence um mm -hmm. on the various um you know um way the climate risk will impact um, your supply chain and I guess in terms of the opportunities you know I think that very much also depends on you know the partners that you work with as well because sometimes it's not just like your company you know uh, makes a commitment um, you know have the structures in place to think about this but you need to kind of bring others along and you need for the innovation to happen you need to have other partners to to work together as well so yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, entirely so. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, that that's a big part of the thinking is, you know, we work with brands uh, who are the who are the front end of it. We're sort of deep in the deep in the supply chain, but but nothing happens without an end to end supply chain focus and and indeed increasingly sort of looking towards circular sort of economy approaches and things that we're uh, doing together with many other partners. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you uh, to Andrew, Justin and Mark for sharing and sorry I had to pick on you. <laughs> uh, and sorry that this uh, whiteboard exercise didn't quite work. But um, yeah, I, I'm just conscious that we only have five minutes left. So maybe Amy, we move on to the final part. Yeah, sure. Um, so 
Yeah, thank you again at those <laughs> who just jumped in <laughs> on the spot there. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we're just going to have a very, very quick look at what else uh, we can offer you to help you on your TCFD journey. Um, so uh, from our side, um, as you know, we've just started this climate action program um, to support businesses on, on your journey to a low carbon economy. Um, but we've also recently, well, we're just launching um, a TCFD working group. Um, so as well as organizing events and activities throughout the year on TCFD, such as this one, we, we have got this group um, that is just about to be launched. Um, and the purpose of it is to really explore opportunities and the issues arising from the TCFD and just to support you as well. So there'll be a lot of opportunities in this group for peer learning, uh, dialogue with experts um, and sharing of good practice as well. So um, the group has a capacity of about 25 member companies, um, which we are almost up to right now. But if you would like any further information on, on this or, or our other plans on TCFD, um, then please do get in contact with us. Um, just hand back over to Elizabeth quickly to talk about the A4S Academy. Thank you. Um, yes, so the A4S Academy is a CFO sponsored program uh, that aims to equip finance teams uh, with the skills that are needed to drive sustainable business within the organization. Um, so the program draws on um, the guidance and tools from our A4S Essential Guide series and there's training on leadership and influence um, and peer-to-peer -peer learning as well um, throughout a year-long program. So the first of a series of uh, 12 money, monthly webinars is starting next Tuesday uh, 26th of May uh, which will be about sustainable finance um, and the one in September will be about TCFD so anyone is welcome to join the webinars you can just sign up online but if you or your finance colleagues uh, are interested in committing to the year-long program you can also find out more information online or you can contact me the details are included in the slides Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'm just going to uh, go for a couple of questions. I've got two minutes. Um, so we, we've had a question come in for Anglo, for Jonathan um, at Anglo American. Um, and it's just about uh, how much of the TCFD has Anglo American taken through their supply chain and to influence their procurement policies? Uh, that's a really good question, which I don't have a good answer to. Um, because, uh, so as, as we read the TCFD, it's not, it's not necessarily an obligation to do so, but clearly in terms of resilience for the long term, it, it, it matters. What I would say is the way in which procurement, our procurement is being driven on things like energy is very much driven by we, uh, climate considerations. I wouldn't necessarily, I'm trying to think off the top of my head how it would fit within the TCFD and I can't see how you specifically would manage it other than in the context of, of strategy. But clearly resilience in the supply chain, I'm hearing what Andrew was just saying about the current supply chain challenges. I mean, that's true also with the climate lens. So not explicitly and not specifically, but we're certainly thinking about things like um, climate when we are procuring energy, for example. I should also say that um, one of the things that we've thought hard about in in understanding our climate risk is, is our own emissions, um, which are large by by company standards, of course, because of the nature of our business. And we understand how we are going to reduce those emissions. And there are certain aspects where, frankly, the supply chain doesn't do it for us. And so we're looking to develop technologies ourselves. And specific to that, we have a, a program of trying to um, transition these massive uh, haul trucks that you see 250 300 ton haul trucks to hydrogen fuel cells as opposed to diesel um, in a perfect world you would have been able to do that through your supply chain i guess we haven't been able to so we're, we're leading that project ourselves so that's come about through tcfd in some ways by understanding specifically where the where the the risks and the the gaps are if you like in our ability to to do what we want to do Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, quickly, I just want to ask Elizabeth as a question. Um, is reporting through the TCFD likely to become mandatory in the future? It looks like we are heading that way. Um, 
at least in the UK, um, and a lot of our members' companies are also preparing themselves um, for mandatory reporting. And I think, you know, what I was sharing um, earlier about the uh, reporting, uh, the regulatory landscape and about what um, Mark Carney said at the TCFD summit last year, you know, he was really urging companies to get ready um, in the sort of coming two years, um, you know, road test how they will um, disclose climate related um, information in their annual reports in the next two years. Otherwise, the, um, you know, the regulators will step in and, you know, tell us what to do and, and make it mandatory. So I think we really need to get prepared for mandatory reporting. Amy, could I just say a word on that, if I may? Yes. I don't want to prolong, and I realise we're just about over time, but I think look out for something around COP26 with regards to mandatory reporting on TCFD. Um, I was involved in some roundtables at COP25 with the incoming presidency, um, and there was a clear sense from uh, the British government at that stage that that was very much in their thinking to try and drive TCFD to be mandatory. Now, clearly it will depend on the sector. It may not be that it's for every sector at once, but we're seeing pressure on the finance sector and from the finance sector that drives into most other sectors, of course, already the, the, the high emitters like ourselves, then we're in that, that category too. So I would see something in the run up to, TC, to, to COP26 as the time when this might become mandatory in this country. Okay, we'll look out for that. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts. Um, so just going to wrap up. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, hopefully you feel encouraged and, you, and you've learned from uh, these really useful presentations. Um, thank you to Elizabeth and Jonathan and Steve. Um, and uh, the, the workshop has been recorded, so this will be sent to you um, afterwards. Um, if your question wasn't answered, um, then we'll also follow up with you um, later on then please do get in contact with either myself or Elizabeth. We'd be happy to help you. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.